With Mario Odyssey being my favorite game of all time, I've been asked by several different people what is the absolute worst part about the game. Even though I think this game knocked it out of the park, there are of course a few things about it I could say here. I hate that you need Joy-Cons to do the downward cap throw without ground pounding. The volleyball moons are super tedious. This moon in Wooded Kingdom is complete garbage. But amongst those flaws, there is one that stands out above the rest. One that could have been super easy to change, and that flaw is located in the Mushroom Kingdom. Welcome to Level by Level Episode 4, the series where I look at a level or set of levels from games to determine how good it actually is. After a brief departure from Odyssey to look at Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, we're back to review the Mushroom Kingdom. Now since this is an analysis on the level as a whole, the major flaw won't be the sole focus of this episode, however it will be an important part of it. For that reason, this episode will be laid out a bit differently from the previous ones. In Episodes 1 and 2, we looked at the Kingdom's aesthetic, design and layout, story, captures, and moods. Since the Mushroom Kingdom doesn't really have any major story or captures, those segments will be mostly cut and the flaw will take its place after the moons. So I guess you could skip all of that if you want, but you'd be missing out on a lot of good level analysis, so don't be that guy. But anyways, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to leave a like and maybe even subscribe to the channel. With all that said, let's jump right into the Mushroom Kingdom's aesthetic. Mario Odyssey's whole gimmick with its kingdoms is that they're a subversion of expectations. Wooded Kingdom seems like it's going to be a forest until we see it's also infused with machinery. Sand Kingdom looks like it'll just be your standard desert until you see that it's actually frozen over. This can go for most kingdoms in the game, however the same cannot be said for the Mushroom Kingdom. This is your simple, grassy and bright area that's present in pretty much every game in the Mario series. Now by that description, you may think that I'm not really a fan of this kingdom, however you would be mistaken. This is where I think it's important to state where in the game's story the Mushroom Kingdom is placed. Visually, this looks like the first level in the game, and if it were any other game in the series, it absolutely would have been. Mario games are known for their grassy areas to allow the player to get used to the gameplay, however Odyssey decided to do things a little differently. Instead of kicking off the game in the comfortable Mushroom Kingdom, we first gain control of Mario in the Cap Kingdom, which has a drastically different color scheme from any other starting level in Mario's history. Okay, unless you count Mario Land because the whole game is in black and white, but you know what I mean. So if the Mushroom Kingdom isn't at the start of the game, then where is it? Well, it's actually the last level you unlock from the main story. After defeating Bowser- oh yes, players. After defeating Bowser on the moon, Mario wakes back up lying on a hill in the Mushroom Kingdom. This is one reason why I personally think this kingdom's basic aesthetic works so well. After a non-stop, fast-paced adventure through several different kingdoms, the Mushroom Kingdom essentially allows you to return home. It's a perfect place to end the game in my opinion. It lets you return to somewhere that's familiar, despite never actually actually coming to the Mushroom Kingdom before this point. I'd argue that this is the most colorful kingdom out of the entire list, aside from Luncheon. The colors here work differently though, as they're all here to make the player feel at ease. The music, or lack thereof, also helps as well. Outside of the castle, no music is present. Instead, you can only hear the birds chirping, which I feel like was done to allow the player to relax while they're here. Oh yeah, and also one of the bird chirps uses the same sound effect from the original Mario Maker. Have fun never on hearing that. So in the end, I think the Mushroom Kingdom did a phenomenal job at accomplishing its goal of being a relaxing hub for the player after the long adventure. Sure, this may not be the most creative aesthetic in the game, heck, it's pretty much taken from any grass world from a previous Mario title, but I feel that it's important to give the players a location they can feel at home at. The Mushroom Kingdom is able to feel distinct from all of the others through its peaceful atmosphere, which I don't really think is replicated in any other kingdom. However, the peaceful atmosphere was not the only goal for this kingdom, as it was also meant to be a nostalgic throwback to previous games in the Mario series. Nostalgia is a very helpful tool in making the player feel at home, and this kingdom delivers in several different ways. I think it'd be best to just list a ton of ways this kingdom goes about referencing previous games with the aesthetic alone. The trees are all based on the main trees from Super Mario 64. As Mario 64 was the Mario game with the strongest inspiration on Odyssey, it easily got the most references here. The biggest of which being the replacement of the moons with stars. Every Every single other kingdom in the game uses moons, however the Mushroom Kingdom distinctly uses Power Stars instead, the main collectibles from Mario 64. The jingle that plays when you collect them is also different, being ripped straight from, you guessed it, Mario 64. <laughs> This helps make the Mushroom Kingdom feel even more different from the other kingdoms while still feeling like a place the player can truly call home. If you thought that was the end of Mario 64 easter eggs though, then you'd be sorely mistaken. The purple coins in this kingdom are modeled after Mario 64's coins. Nowadays the coins just have a simple line down the middle, but back then they had a star design placed within them. But of course, the biggest and best reference in this kingdom is what you can buy with those purple coins. You could use these purple coins to purchase a costume that is just the Mario 64 character model. This is without a doubt my favorite costume in the game. Not only does it work perfectly with Mario, but man, it's just a fantastic way to reference Mario's past appearance. Mario 64 was my favorite 3D Mario game before Odyssey, so seeing this was in the game would have been such a nice surprise.
But Prosophia Gaming over here had to upload a video with it in the thumbnail right before I got to the Mushroom Kingdom. Gosh, he sucks! Mario 64 isn't the only Mario game reference in this kingdom, though, as several others make some minor appearances. I didn't actually notice this before writing the video, but the mushrooms here are actually based on the original colors for the SMB1 mushroom and 1-Up. And also the mini mushroom, because why not? I mentioned earlier that the trees were based on the original Mario 64 trees, however one of them is actually different. This one over here is based on the tree from the opening of Super Mario 3D Land that scatters its nuke leaves across the game. This reference was super unexpected for me, so I thought it was really cool that they decided to include it. This isn't even close to all the references, however some of them require that I talk about the kingdom's layout, so we'll get to those soon enough. But I'm sure that you could tell by this long list that the Mushroom Kingdom does an excellent job providing the player with several different forms of nostalgia throughout the entire kingdom. All of this goes toward this being a calming and familiar place to end the game on, but how does that design and layout further help sell this feeling? First off, the Mushroom Kingdom is one of the seven large kingdoms in the game. If you missed the first two episodes of the series, we could basically determine the size of a kingdom based on their purple coin counts. Mini kingdoms have none, medium kingdoms have 50, and large kingdoms have 100. That makes the Mushroom Kingdom the first large kingdom in this series. In my opinion, this kingdom being one of the large ones was very important in helping sell the peaceful and nostalgic feel we've been talking about. Pretty much all of the medium kingdoms follow a more linear pattern, while still having places to explore, they generally all lead to one main spot. Cap is the most obvious, it all leads to Cap Tower with a few places to explore on the way. Lost is a more complex medium kingdom, but still, the path generally all leads to the top of the mountain. I'm not saying that being somewhat linear is bad, by the way, I think that was a perfect way to design these kingdoms. Those were all meant to be locations traveled to on your main journey, however the Mushroom Kingdom is not the same. While some of the larger kingdoms could be made out to have a general linear path as well, overall, the big kingdoms are much more open than the smaller ones. This is what I believe was the correct decision for the Mushroom Kingdom. Now that the game is over, there isn't really a big objective to accomplish anymore. It's time to relax. While yes, you could go to the castle, the Mushroom Kingdom is designed open enough to where that isn't really a direction the player has to go in. This makes this kingdom feel much more like a free and open playground, I'd even go as far as to say that this is probably one of the most open kingdoms in the entire game to just run around in. Sand still has a beat of course, however that kingdom's goal was to give a player a large amount of land to explore with periodic locations sprinkled into it. Mushroom Kingdom brings all of those locations closer together, making the space feel more populated, but still open enough to allow the player to run anywhere. Again, I'm not saying that the other kingdoms are bad for how they do their exploration, I'm just saying this method works best for the Mushroom Kingdom's goal of being a relaxing endgame location. But how does this kingdom use its size to its advantage? Well, the centerpiece of the kingdom is of course the castle itself. While the kingdom does provide an obvious path towards it from the start, you can go pretty much anywhere you'd like. Instead of the kingdom being a path to the castle with things along it like how Cascade can be seen as a path to the Madame Brutal boss fight, all of the interesting locations just sort of orbit around the castle. While the shape isn't exactly a perfect circle, it's the closest kingdom to that. Shut up, Cloud Kingdom doesn't count. But yes, the layout of this kingdom allows you to run pretty much anywhere you'd like to go, giving this kingdom a playground sort of feel. But what locations are scattered around the kingdom that we could explore? Well, going from the start, we have the plaza. This lets us greet several different NPCs and of course go to the shop. Not only does the fountain look really nice here, but it also adds to that homey feel of the Mushroom Kingdom by putting so many familiar faces here. Going from there, we have the lake featuring Dory. Many of these different places around the castle look completely different from one another, but still similar enough to feel like they belong together, and this is no exception. Several moons are located here as well, along with one of the many towers. We'll get back to these towers in the moon section, but they're a great way to give players several different points of interest along the map. They stand out distinctly from anything else around them, which is important for catching a player's attention. The sides of the castle both have towers of their own, along with a few smaller places of interest like the 2D section, maze, and sheep pen to name a few. Finally, the back of the castle is another distinct area, being made out of dirt which sticks out from the normal grass of the rest of the kingdom. This is also the only part of the outdoors to contain any enemies, in this case a few Goombas. It'd feel weird if no Goombas were present at all, plus this works as a great way to display this kingdom's brand new capture, which we'll get to in a minute. Finally, there's the castle itself. This holds a majority of the kingdom's moon, so it makes sense to be the center point of the kingdom that everything else revolves around. Now I don't think we could talk about the castle without getting into the references portion of the layout segment, so let's go ahead and look into that. The castle itself is, shocker, strongly based on Mario 64's rendition of it. This goes for both the outside and inside of the castle. I mean, just by looking at it, we can see the moat and the bridge up front, the giant stained glass, and the four pillars along the side. Now, this has pretty much been the design of Peach's castle ever since Mario 64, so it really wasn't that much of a surprise. What was a bit more surprising was the interior layout looking almost directly ripped from that game. While there are sadly no doors to other rooms, I guess Peach just phases through the walls or something, this is the exact same format as the room all those years ago. They even kept that iconic sun texture in the center as well. The music is also a new version of the Peach's Castle theme from that game, adding to the nostalgia even more. 
Speaking of sounds, the moat on the outside of the castle can also be drained like in Mario 64. When you successfully pull out all of the posts, the puzzle solved theme from Mario 64 will also play. Now originally, I was going to make this segment longer, but I thought I might as well just cover the rest of what I had here in the moons, or I guess stars section of this video, so let's jump right into those. Now the moons in this kingdom can be divided into three distinct categories. First there are the moons that are meant to play in your nostalgia for previous Mario games. Then there are the ones that are repeats of similar moons found throughout the entirety of Odyssey. And the final set, well, we'll get to those when we get there. First, let's rapid fire through the nostalgia moons. The first chance you get of seeing the Mushroom Kingdom, aside from the opening cutscene, is a painting in Luncheon. This isn't just some random floating island that you're standing on, though, as it's actually a very accurate recreation of Yoshi's house from Super Mario World, just made more 3D, of course. Even though technically Yoshi's home is in Dinosaur Land, I'm obviously very happy about this being their chosen location. Not only is the location very cool, but the star itself is as well. See, normally the moon would just be right next to the painting once you exit it. However, in this case, you have to do a little bit of exploration and parkour to collect the star on the top of the chimney. This makes this easily the best warp painting moon. The 2D section located at the bottom of this, uh, actually I have no idea what this is supposed to be, but anyway, this section has a much stronger emphasis on the original Super Mario Bros. aesthetic than almost any other sub-area. Obviously the one in New Donk City that's literally just 1-1 has it beat, but this area doesn't do a bad job either. I like how the whole area is designed to be like the original game, with even the ground having its original texture. The main moon itself is also very challenging, being one of the most difficult 2D moons in the entire game, fitting for an endgame location. You have to stay within the 2D section as it scrolls, as if you fall out, you'll return to the 3D world and die. While I'm not usually a huge fan of auto-scrolling levels, I still find this one to be decently fun. This doesn't conflict with the Mushroom Kingdom's easygoing nature either, as placing it in a sub-area separates it from the calming exterior, allowing for both to have their own distinct feelings. Oh, and using the bullet bills to get above the starting area is a lot of fun, even if you don't get anything for it. The tree we mentioned before, based on 3D land, also has the moon attached to its tail. Mechanically, it's nothing special, but it just fits so well. Being able to throw Cappy on things for this moon is probably the only reason this tree is here in the first place. Now of course, Mario 64 got the most of these sort of reference moons. First off is the one inside of the castle. The sun pattern isn't just here for show, as if you look up at the ceiling, you'll be able to collect a star. This is an obvious reference to how Mario has to enter the Tower of the Wing Cap stage in Mario 64, so this is a fun inclusion. Now this may be a bit of a stretch to call nostalgia moons, but I'm placing the moons from Yoshi under this category as well. I'm not sure about anyone else, but the first thing I did when entering this kingdom was jump up to the castle's roof, and sure enough, there he was. This location is of course based on where he's located after collecting 120 stars in Mario 64. This being the first kingdom Yoshi is found in makes this encounter even more special. He's a lot of fun to control, with the way his tongue is able to stick to several different surfaces, allowing you to climb up them or even gain speed. While the way he spawns is based on Mario 64, his moons are more closely tied to his 2D appearances. In those games, Yoshi could eat fruit, and a certain amount of them would give you a power-up. The same applies here, however this time he'll give you a star after eating a certain amount. Four moons are collected this way in this kingdom, which gives you plenty of opportunity to explore, especially in the dirt area with the Goombas. That area also gives you a chance to learn how to use Yoshi against enemies. One of those moons are done in a sub-area filled with colorful blocks, which has been a staple of Mario pretty much since Mario 3. I also really love how the sub-area has those eels from Jolly Roger Bay for absolutely no reason. I mean, this takes place in the sky, so it's just a really funny surprise to see them pop up for the first time. The final two reference moons are the two located in the sub-area. For those of you that don't have eyes, this is a one-to-one -one recreation of the courtyard from Super Mario 64. I love how they kept the classic look intact, even making the trees 2D textures that rotate towards the camera like the original's trees. They also kept the castle's, uh, broken up design from the original as well. As for the stars located here, there's one on the iconic Ella's real statue, which is just perfect for Odyssey. The other is the largest chest guess and check room in the game. I'm guessing that this moon type is found here because it originated in Mario 64, but I'm just really not a huge fan of it. At least in Odyssey, they tell you the solution after each failed attempt, so this star is at least decent. But anyways, that's the last of the sort of reference moon. I think they all help truly sell this kingdom's nostalgic feel, as without them, yeah, there'd be cool references, but none of them would be that horribly distinct. With stars tied to some of them, though, it really makes these some of the most memorable in the game. But speaking of moons seen throughout the game, let's take a look at our second section of moons, the repeated moon. Now, I know a lot of people have issues with Odyssey reusing moon concepts, however, I always felt as though they were done well. 
None of them are exactly the same as one another, as each is changed and adapted to their own kingdom. While most kingdoms will only get a few of the common moon types, the Mushroom Kingdom basically acts as a hub for all of the main moon types seen in Odyssey. Running through them quickly, we have a Rabbit Moon, which might be a reference to Mario 64 DS, but I personally always just thought that it was a coincidence. Then we have the four Seed Moons. This is probably the easiest set in the game, but I wouldn't call them bad moons, as they still encourage exploration of the kingdom. There's a moon based on growing flowers, not the most common type, but one seen a few times during the game nonetheless. The Timer Challenge is a fun little stroll through the woods. By the way, I definitely need to start reading the brochure before I start scripting these, because the description of this area is very funny. I just like how they say it's a bit more scary than pictured. Oh, and also the canon shape for the Mario 64 coins is 64-esque. The dog moon is, well, a dog moon. I don't really like them. No, that's not the game's big flaw. We're getting to that. Just be patient. The notes and sheep are pretty standard, but they were necessary inclusions if this kingdom wanted to represent everything. The Goomba Moon is one of my favorites of that genre. Normally, you're supposed to drain the moat to get it, but if you have a tall enough stack, you can sacrifice some of them to the water and make it across to the female Goomba. The shop, Captain Toad, Music Toad, and the Tourist are all found in the plaza, so they're pretty standard. The hint art is a pretty fun one, I've always liked how the art itself looked. It is a bit wonky hitting the exact spot you need to in Cap Kingdom since you can change the camera around, but overall it's still a great hint art. Picture Match reappears in this kingdom, this time being based on Mario rather than a Goomba. Picture Match was like the one good thing Cloud Kingdom had, so I'm happy it's here in an actually good kingdom. So as you can see, pretty much every single moon type is found here. But the real question is, why is that the case? Well, you could look at it cynically and say it was just a lazy way to extend gameplay time, but personally, I find it to be a way to show how far you've come playing throughout the game. These moons are meant to remind you of the journey you just had, and sort of display all of the different activities you did along the way. Sure, most of these are easy, but that goes well with this kingdom as a whole. However, no moons are better at reminding the player of their journey than the six boss rematches scattered throughout the kingdom. In order to give the player a chance to refight every boss in the game after completing each of the kingdom's stories, remakes versions of the boss fights are found within these towers I mentioned before. Not every boss is here, but the Brutals, Mecha Brutal, Madame Brood, and Bowser all let you rematch them somewhere else. These six bosses are all of the kingdom exclusive bosses that we fight on our journey. Those are Nucleotech, Torque Drift, Mecha Wiggler, Molesk, uh, something something, Cookatiel, and the Lord of Lightning. All of them got unique changes to make them more difficult versions of their original fights. I'm really happy that they decided to do this, as it provides the Mushroom Kingdom with some challenge that doesn't get in the way of its calming exterior due to these being placed within buildings and sub-areas. Looking at these changes in order from least favorite to favorite, we have the Seaside Boss. The change here is that the entire battle takes place in the sky, which would be a decent challenge, but for some reason it's constantly raining during the fight, meaning you can never run out of water for the gushing. If you had to carefully use your water between very few refill platforms, then this actually could have been pretty good, but as it is now, it's honestly easier than the original. Cookatiel's only change is that moon snakes are added to the edges. While technically making the boss harder, it's not really that big of a difference, and it's definitely the least creative out of the six. Luckily, the other four bosses are all great. Torque Drift adds in these ring dispensers at the side of the arena, making its lasers harder to avoid. It's a more basic change than the other three, but it fits perfectly within this boss. The Mecha Wiggler clones itself, leading to some pretty neat team attacks. The only reason this isn't higher is because I still have a grudge against the Mecha Wiggler for being annoying in speedruns. Plus, I wish that when crawling on the wall, they actually separated from each other. The Lord of Lightning's arena is now covered in ice, which not only makes the boss fight harder, but also makes the fight look quite different as well, making you have a bluer color scheme compared to the original's purple. The Dragon's shockwaves are also changed so they'll now go vertically a bit as well. The only thing I don't like about this is that he only has one type of shockwave pattern now. If they were different for each head slam, then he'd easily be my favorite rematch. Okay, well they might actually be different, but they're not noticeably different. Nucleotech, though, is my favorite. He will now summon a ton of mummies to pester you during the fight. Not only do the mummies fit this boss perfectly, considering they're both from Toast Arena, but they make this boss significantly more difficult than the original. They make it to where you can't really stay in one place for long, but standing on top of the ice is what you need to do to defeat the boss, adding a ton of pressure to the player. The way they spawn during the phase of the fight where the icicles start to fall from the ceiling force the player to move very carefully. I would argue that this is the single largest leap in difficulty for any of the boss fights, which I really appreciate. So in short, they did a great job with the boss fight rematches, allowing the player to be reminded of their journey while also providing new, more difficult challenges. That's why I think this Kingdom's Moon selection is, while being composed of concepts we've seen before, still very solid. However, you all may have noticed a glaring exception, something I haven't mentioned yet. That one thing is, of course, this weird tile moon inside of the castle. It doesn't really fit into any of the categories I listed, like it's the only one like this in the game and it's fun to collect, but I just don't understand its placement. Okay, no, but seriously, with the Mushroom Kingdom having the most moons out of any kingdom in the entire game with 104 total, where did they all come from? We've only really discussed the first 43. The other 61 belong to what I think is Mario Odyssey's biggest flaw. Its single biggest weakness is Toadette.
In concept, I like what they were trying to do with this. Toadette's moons essentially act as achievements for the player. Jump a certain number of times, you get a moon. Collect a certain type of moon, you get another moon. Achievements have been in games for a long time now, and I've personally always enjoyed them. Except in Mario Maker 2, that was hell. But giving the player pre-made goals to strive for, difficult or not, has always been something I really liked. This is the first mainline Mario game to have achievements like this, so upon seeing her for the first time, I was incredibly excited. Since I'm already talking about the positives, we might as well cover the only other one I have for these moons that isn't the concept. Ironically, it has to do with not doing them. Since these moons give you a counter for basic actions like jumping, throwing cappy, collecting coins, and so on, this leads to a ton of no-jump runs or no-coin runs to be possible. I mean, sure, you could do them for other Mario games, but none of them would provide you with what's essentially a token of completion, with zero being underneath your counter. This motivated me to do both a coinless and jumpless run, so I'm really happy about that. I'm sure this was the same for many others as well, so these did a really good job of giving the push that we needed. But, that's it for the positives. Now it's time to start a rant about every single little thing this does wrong. Let's get the obvious, biggest one out of the way first. There are 61 achievement moons, but that's not really a big deal, is it? Well, why don't we go ahead and collect some of those right now? right, Toadette hands out each and every single achievement moon, one at a time. That means you have to go through the animation of Mario talking to Toadette, have her tell you which achievement you're receiving, and then finally go through the animation of collecting the moon. For every single achievement. This is without a doubt the most needlessly tedious thing in the game. There is such an easy solution to this as well, just have her give you all of the achievement moons you currently completed at the exact same time. Now I didn't sit through collecting all 61 moons for this video, I just looped the same few several times, but the time I displayed is indeed accurate to how long it would take to collect most of them. I have no idea how this was able to get past playtesting. What, were the playtesters just so terrible that they only got one achievement at a time? Because the instant you have to collect two or three at the same time, you could just see how tedious it is. There is no way to defend this decision to keep all of the moons separated. And listen, I love this game. My channel is named after it, and I spent the first three quarters of this video praising its design for the Mushroom Kingdom. But I just cannot ignore how bad of a design choice this was. Mario Odyssey was designed to allow the player to do things at their own pace. It's clear by how many movement options Mario has and how many shortcuts there are to defeat the bosses and collect several moons. But Toda here goes completely against all of that. And you know what? Maybe I'd be able to look past all of this tedium. Maybe I'd still be able to call these good moons that are just a bit slow to collect after completing. But these achievements aren't even that great. To understand why I don't like these achievements, we need to look back on what I actually like about the concept. To me personally, achievements fall under two categories, milestones, and much more interestingly, challenges for the players to complete. They're a relatively simple way of giving something new for the player to do with stuff already in the game. For example, most of the Smash series has had achievements in the form of challenges. Some of these are what I'd call milestones. Basically, they point the player in the right direction so that they know what they should be doing in order to complete the game. In Ultimate, this includes stuff like awakening a fighter in World of Light or defeating Dracula. This is stuff that you'd already be doing on your way to 100%, but these achievements can act as a direct pointer for the player so that they know what they're supposed to do. The more interesting challenges are the ones that are, well, actual challenges. This is where I think the concept of achievements really shine, as they make you do stuff that you might not normally do in order to complete the game. For example, you have to try and score 7,650 points with Pac-Man's Final Smash, deal over 40% with a single attack from Incineroar, complete Century Smash as Ken while only using specials, and so on. While some people may happen to do these on their way to complete the game, most people wouldn't even think about doing these, making these challenges memorable and actually fun to do. Smash's challenges are especially good as they can be used to display what makes each character unique, which helps the player learn more about the game as they play. This brings us back to our main topic, Mario Odyssey. None of Toadette's achievement moons even come close to the examples of fun challenges I described from Ultimate. Do you want to know why? Well, it's because nearly every single one of these 61 moons are those milestone achievements. Now, I did say that they could be good. However, it meant that they could be good only when still in the presence of good challenge achievements. You know what? Let's take a look and see just how many of these moons could be even considered challenges. I consider something to be a challenge if it's something that you wouldn't have had to do to get 100% regardless of the achievement's existence. 100% would be getting all of the stars you can, 
so collecting every moon, purple coin, captures, music, souvenirs, and costumes. So, which of these Toadad achievements are things that are not literally required to get 100%, excluding the achievements themselves, of course? Well, we can eliminate all of the moon collecting ones, bringing us down to 22 already. Obviously, beating Bowser is required to complete the game at all, so that achievement is gone as well. Getting World Peace and opening Moon Rocks are required to get every moon, so that's another two down. Next, we can eliminate the captures, costumes, and souvenir achievements, since we already specified those as a 100% requirement. We can also remove the regional coin shopper ones, since we need to use every single one of them to collect all the outfits and souvenirs. We can now also remove the coin counter ones, since you need much more than 10,000 coins in order to buy all of the costumes in the game. That leaves us with only five moons that can even be considered challenge moons. Even then, it's kind of hard to believe that someone wouldn't complete these by the time they reach 100%. You only have to throw Cappy 5,000 times, which may seem like a lot, but it really isn't. You don't technically need to hit every single checkpoint in the game, but you're more than likely going to in order to warp to those locations during the game. The World Warper one is a huge stretch to include here. Technically, it is possible to collect many of the painting moons without using the paintings, but it's more of a challenge to collect these without the paintings than to actually use them. Jumping 10,000 times is, in my opinion, the only good challenge. There's still a chance a player may not reach this after 100%, so I think this is the one decent challenge Moon Toadette has, though it's not very creative. So with pretty much every single one of these moons being milestones, what's the point of including them at all? Achievements should be used to provide the player with new goals to strive for, rather than just adding on to what they already would have done. All these do is force you to waste your time talking to Toadette. None of them make you go out of your way to try something new, they're all just incredibly bland. And again, that's not to say that this was a bad concept. This is their first time trying something like this, but in a possible Odyssey 2, I hope they cut out the filler and throw in some really fun and memorable challenges. None of these moons are necessarily bad by themselves, but it's the fact that there are no good challenge moons taking advantage of the concept that really hurts them all in my opinion. Worst of all though, Mario Odyssey doesn't even do these milestone moons correctly. Remember how I said the Mushroom Kingdom is the last one you unlock? Well, that means you're only going to be able to see these Toadette moons after completing the game. That means the player is already well accustomed to what the gameplay of Odyssey is, and they don't really need any pointers anymore. Heck, the menus even tell you the exact number of things you collect, so it's not like you need the milestone achievements to tell you there are 52 captures in the game. Smash Ultimate's challenges are open to see from the very start of the game, meaning the player is primed to look at all of them from the very start and begin to understand what you could truly do here. You know what, we've talked about Smash enough. Let's look at one of my absolute favorite achievement systems from any game I've played, Minecraft's Advancements. These strike a perfect balance of milestone achievements and challenge achievements for the player. Furthermore, the advancements are going to be one of the first things you see when you start a new world, which are then able to point you in the right direction to eventually beat the game with its web design. You're able to see how to unlock more advancements as you go, but you can still unlock them at any time. The challenge advancements, though, are the clear highlight. Many of them are even given a unique shape or text to make them stand out from the milestones. Return to Sender, which you get for killing a gas with its own fireball, Serious Dedication, which you get for making another right hoe, and of course, How Did We Get Here, which is received after having every single effect applied to the player at once, are some of the most memorable things to do in the entire game. And that brings us back to Odyssey for one final time. None of these achievements are distinct. No one's favorite memory in the game is collecting one of these. Heck, they're probably the low point for many players. It's not like there couldn't have been good challenges either. Maybe they could have had to complete the darker side while wearing the invisibility cap. Maybe they could have defeated all six bosses in the Mushroom Kingdom without dying or even taking damage. Maybe they could have to even try to defeat the Robo Brood on the dark side without using a hammer bro. There are so many options that could have been implemented, but instead they went with the most boring route possible. This is without a doubt my least favorite part of Super Mario Odyssey, for not only being incredibly tedious to collect, but for being such a waste of a fantastic concept. If they do bring this back for the next Mario game, I would put Toadette near the start of the game instead and also make the achievements much more interesting. As they are right now though, I believe them to be Mario Odyssey's single biggest flaw. So with all of that discussed, where does the Mushroom Kingdom belong on my level by level series tier list? If you missed the last episode, I decided to start a tier list comparing all of the stages from level by level. S tier describes levels that are or are very close to being perfect, whereas F tier are levels that fail in almost every aspect. Since Toda exists in this kingdom, we obviously can't put this in S tier, however I would say this flaw pertains to the whole game rather than just the kingdom itself. Mushroom Kingdom was pretty much just the messenger here, so I don't think it can truly take all the blame. Aside from the Toadette moons, the rest of the kingdom does a great job of reminding the player 
of how far they've come on their journey throughout the game. The boss rematches here were almost all incredibly well done, certainly better than Galaxy's boss rematches, but that's a topic for another day. The Yoshi capture also gave this kingdom a few unique types of moons as well, and the several references to Mario's past makes this kingdom a lot of fun to explore. The large size also makes this have a substantial amount of content overall. So, with everything said, despite the Toadette Moons bringing this down a bit, I think the Mushroom Kingdom belongs just above the darker side of the moon in A tier. Both kingdoms do what they set out to do perfectly, but have minor flaws that stand in their way of being S tier. Keep in mind, the tiers are subject to change in later episodes, but as of right now, I think this is a good spot for this kingdom. But anyways, that's it for this video. Are you all mad I didn't mention the binoculars capture in this kingdom? Let me know in the comments. I was originally kind of scared that this episode would be a bit lacking in content, but the more I played through this kingdom, the more I found to write about, and I think this led to the script being one of the best in the whole series. If you do want to check out the other episodes, I have a playlist linked on screen now and in the description. If you all have any suggestions for levels for future episodes, then feel free to let me know in the comments. Remember, this series isn't only stuck to Mario games, so feel free to put in whatever you'd like. Who knows, maybe next episode will be about the great complexity of Minecraft's igloo or something. Anyways, dry bones for Smash, and I'll see you guys next time.